Okay, I think we'll get started if that's okay. Hello everyone, and it's wonderful to see so many people in the audience. I'm Alex Coulter, Director of the National Centre for Creative Health. A warm welcome to our fourth round table for the Creative Health Review on end of life, on end of life care and bereavement. Previous roundtables have been on mental health, health inequalities and social care. They're now available to watch on YouTube and we will put the link in the chat. The roundtables are in Zoom webinar format, which means we can't see our audience. Over 200 people signed up for today's event. Please do say who you are in the chat and we encourage you to share ideas and information via chat. When it comes to the Q&A time, please could you put your questions into the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to ask a question to a specific speaker, please say who that is. If you have any technical concerns, please put them in the chat and we will try and help. The National Centre for Creative Health and the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Arts, Health and Wellbeing's Creative Health Review aims to highlight the potential for creative health to help tackle pressing issues in health and social care and more widely, including health inequalities and the additional challenges we face as we recover from COVID. We have a panel of commissioners with a wide breadth of ex expertise, and they will help us translate the findings from the review into recommendations for policymakers to encourage and inform the development of a cross-governmental creative health strategy. This roundtable will explore how creative health can contribute to high quality end of life care in hospice, hospital and home settings, how creative approaches can be used to support people through bereavement and grief and how we can ensure such approaches are available to all who need them. We are including a trigger warning for this event as part of the roundtable, we will be discussing death and dying and feelings around bereavement. This will include some participants talking about their experiences of loss. If at any point you find it hard to continue watching or listening, we encourage you to take a moment away from the session and return when you feel ready. Also, we will send a recording of the roundtable to all attendees if you prefer to watch the session at your own pace. We are very grateful to Dr. Goody Singh, who is going to chair the round table. Goody is a consultant paediatrician, health campaigner and TV broadcaster. She is keen to humanise healthcare and believes the arts and humanities will make this happen. Passionate about, passionate about social justice and health equity, Goody has worked around the world, including with the World Health Organisation, Health Education England and in resource poor settings. She is also a trustee of the National Centre for Creative Health. Thanks, Goody. Over to you. Well, thank you, Alex. And it's a great pleasure to be able to chair this session this morning. Now, creative approaches are commonly used in end of life care to improve well-being and quality of life, helping people to process and express emotion and maintain human connection. Creativity can also play an important role during bereavement and grief. In this roundtable, we have a fantastic panel, panel of speakers who will share the various ways that they have used or experienced creativity in this context. In part one, we will hear some mini presentations from panelists and we will then have a short break and audience members can then post any questions they have into our chat and then we will address those in part two. So let's start with our first uh, part and the mini presentations and i'd like to welcome dr lucy selman who's associate professor in palliative and end of life care at the university of bristol now lucy will provide an overview of the research relating to the use of creativity in end of life care and introduce the good grief festival over to you lucy thank you so much i'm delighted to be here i'm going to go straight straight on and um, share my slides Okay, can everyone see that? Okay, thank you. So I guess what I'm not going to do is partly what Goody just said I might do, which is give a complete overview of um, the use of creativity in arts and in end of life care and bereavement support, purely because it's such a huge subject, really. So 
Um, the potential role of creativity and end of life care bereavement support is so extensive and I think the Creative Health Inquiry Report of 2017 actually gives a really nice overview of the evidence in that area. So I'm not going to try and replicate that here, but I do see that there's two main areas in which creativity plays a central role. So first of all, um, there's uh, evidence around the use of creativity for individuals living with serious illness, caregiving um, or facing bereavement. Um, and this is really a focus on the use of arts and creativity as a personal resource, so helping with sense making, processing, coping and self care. And then there's a second batch of evidence, which is around the formal interventions, um, and this, these are interventions integrated with palliative care and end of life care services and bereavement services. And as you'd expect, this has been the primary area of focus for academic research um, over the last sort of um, 30 to 40 years, really. In this presentation, though, I want to focus on the second role, which I've described here, which receives relatively little attention in the Creative Health Inquiry Report, but which I think um, is a really important one and where there's real opportunity in the, in the UK at the moment to, to harness the role of creativity. And that's within communities using a public health approach. Um, and in this role, creativity and the arts are used to provide um, opportunities to learn, to increase confidence, um, empowerment, and to express and share personal experiences. And the focus here is often on equity and changing societal attitudes. So within the palliative care, public health approaches um, have really been developed over the last 20 years or so. And they view care at the end of life and in bereavement as everyone's responsibility and the community as an equal partner. So public health palliative care aims to improve the relevance of palliative care and bereavement services, widen access to support, to develop people's skills, knowledge and capacities within communities and to support coping and resilience in the face of death, dying and loss. So public health approach is actually now embedded within national guidance um, in the UK, including in the National Palliative and End of Life Care Partnerships Ambitions, which emphasise the need to develop community partnerships, improve public awareness and implement co-design approaches in palliative and end of life care. So why do we need a public health approach in this area? Well, first of all, there are known inequities in terms of who gets access to palliative care and bereavement support. So we know that people living in the UK's most deprived areas are less likely to get the um, care and support that they need if they become seriously ill or a loved one dies. And there are specific groups, including minoritised ethnic groups, LGBTQ plus communities and other groups, including older people over the age of 85 and people with non-cancer diagnosis who experience specific barriers accessing end of life care and bereavement support. And these include things like a lack of awareness, of available services, discomfort, asking for help, discrimination and a lack of appropriate services. Lack of capacity and specialist staff is also a huge issue, especially given that um, it's predicted that 160,000 more people per year in England and Wales will need palliative care by 2040. And in addition, there's documented problems with our society's attitudes to death and bereavement, which might not come as a surprise to, to everybody here. So, for example, 32% of the general public say they don't know how to start a conversation after a bereavement. And this translates into a lack of support for people facing the end of life or living with bereavement. So national surveys last year found that 60% of bereaved people say their community hasn't helped them deal with their grief. And 79% of bereaved people say that the informal support available to them hadn't sufficiently met their needs. So how can creativity help? Well, um, I like this quote from Jill Sonka and colleagues in the US. In, um, she says, throughout human history, the arts have been used to accomplish the very things public health is currently challenged to do. Support well-being, create social connection, spark and sustain movements, communicate across difference and transform systems and cultures. And both the arts and culture and public health sectors work to create stronger, healthier and more equitable communities. However, she ends, we're missing the power of their combined strengths. And I think in England, especially, we have a real opportunity to do this now with the rollout of the integrated care systems. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a bit. So for the second half of my presentation, um, I was invited to just talk about um, Good Grief Festival. 
Um, this is an initiative which was started in October 2020, and it gives an example of how creativity can support a public health approach to palliative care and bereavement support. So the festival is led by a few of us at the University of Bristol, and we work with um, freelance event producers and a large network of collaborators and supporters across the UK and in fact internationally now. So we had um, over 88,500 um, people um, attend the first festival over the initial weekend and the weeks that followed, which was many more than we um, initially anticipated. And since then, we've had over 26,000 people again engage with the festival content and um, the webinars. So we ran two more festivals and a course in 2021, and then um, last year moved to standing, sta uh, holding standalone events and mini festivals. So the aims of Good Grief Festival to provide ways to talk, think, learn about and share experiences of grief, to widen access to knowledge and research and to bereavement support and services. And we've always had a really strong focus on diversity and inclusion within our programming. And the overall aim is to help support a shift in social attitudes, improve grief literacy and support the development of compassionate communities. And this was, of course, especially important in the context of the pandemic. So here are just a few of our recent events, um, which were held in December. Um, these were on the theme of how grief affects family relationships. And our next upcoming event is on the 25th of February. So if you go to our website and you can sign up and all our events are free to attend. We also launched in September 2022 and um, the Grief Channel on YouTube. This was to make um, all of our previous um, content um, open access. So please do have a look and subscribe. And if you like the look of it, tell your colleagues as well. Throughout this work, a key ingredient of how we work has been um, integrating arts, culture and creativity, as this provides a way into challenging um, topics like death and dying and grief, and it opens up new perspectives. It also provides an insight into the lived experience of grief, both its individual nature and its cultural specificity, but also its universality. And importantly, in terms of Good Grief Festival, it gives examples of how we can all express our continued relationship with loved ones who've died and opportunities for self-expression and processing grief. Um, and we've done this through um, holding uh, panel events and interviews, which integrate the perspectives of, of artists, um, writers, um, authors, um, poets, um, painters, filmmakers, um, but also through running creative workshops as well and providing opportunities for people to share their experiences. In terms of impact, just very briefly, so this data is from an evaluation of our first festival in 2020 primarily. So we found afterwards 89% rated the festival as excellent or very good. Um, and this actually went up a little bit at the second festival. And then really importantly for us, um, over three quarters of, of people who attended um, said they agreed or strongly agreed with the statement through attending the festival, I feel more confident talking about grief. So the festival does seem to have a positive impact on grief literacy um, and, and hopefully helps people communicate with people who've been bereaved. Um, and attending a greater number of festival events was associated with a higher rate of experience and confidence. So before I end, I wanted to flag um, a new project which we're currently conducting. So we received funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council to set up a community network in Western Supermare, which is a deprived seaside town um, in North Somerset, and it's actually where I live. Um, and this is a collaborative project working with Arts Health Southwest, the Integrated Care System um, here in, in North Somerset, um, Culture Western and many other stakeholders in the community. And we are working together to explore how the integrated care system can work with community assets, including creativity in the arts, to reduce inequities in end of life care and bereavement and tackle social isolation. So if you're interested in that, please do take a look at our website. Throughout the project, we're integrating um, arts and creativity. So that won't um, come as a surprise. But here you can see a really nice visual uh, illustration of our first um, community network meeting, which we held in December. We're running Good Grief um, Western in collaboration with all of the local stakeholders. So this will be a live in-person festival in May. Um, and we've also provided some cross-sector training um, with people attending from health and social care, but also community artists and development workers and the No Barriers Here approach. So this is an arts-based me method for 
um, encouraging um, and facilitating conversations about death, dying and what matters most in life um, called No Barriers Here. So if you look at the website, it's a, it's a really brilliant initiative. And that's a photo of um, everyone receiving the training a couple of weeks ago in Western. So please do get in touch um, if you'd like to find out more about what we're doing or if anything we're doing resonates with your own work. And I'd like to thank all of our collaborators and colleagues and funders. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Lucy Salmon, for a brilliant start to our session and for bringing up um, both the public health approach and the role of creativity in changing cultural discourses around things like grief. So I'm going to move us on to our next speaker today, um, Anna Ledgard, who's an end of life doula, teacher, producer, and project manager. And Anna will introduce her practice as an end of life doula and how she incorporates creativity into this role. So Anna, are you with us? Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Thanks very much, Goody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks um, for hosting this really important conversation. Yeah, I've done many things in my life. Um, I, I'd, I'd say mainly been a teacher in lots of different ways, but also an arts producer, working often in hospitals and hospices. And now I'm a doula. But um, I think to say I've been privileged to work with an amazing group of artists, amongst them Mark Stora, and uh, Sophie Layton, whose work some of you will know, and to work latterly with very ill children and their families, often towards the very ends of their lives, either in paediatric or neonatal intensive care units or in hospice. And I'm also a doula myself, an end of life companion to the dying. So why the arts? Well, I think Lucy's put it all very well, but um, I think for me, it's about the arts provides another form. It's an other, an other space for children or adults to express something of what's happening to them and what it feels like. And very often in intensive care wards in a children's hospital, the adult attention is, in, is focused so much on the medical imperative to make the child better that the voice of the child may not be heard. Uh, they're very grateful to everybody. Children are incredibly grateful to the medics who are looking after them and they don't want to make their parents sad, so they don't talk about death. The artists have a very important role to play here because they can offer a different kind of language, a language of metaphor, perhaps a non-verbal non language, a visual vocabulary, which can express something of this emotional landscape. And they can also offer a form to share this with others. I'm just going to show you two images. This is a picture made by a young girl who, in the wise and honest way that I think only young children can, taught me so much about the importance of finding ways to talk about death and the power of creativity and metaphor in this. So she wrote a poem alongside her picture and her poem began, Once upon a time there was a young princess who often didn't feel well. For all of her life she was often sick. And her poem ended, the stars had clustered together to form a ladder. The prince gripped onto it. He closed his eyes and carefully walked down step by step, straight into the princess's room. Whatever we may read into these metaphors, what poetry and art had done here was to offer a language for this little girl to express something of what it felt like to be coming to the end of a short life. Others talked about death more openly, for example, a 16 year old who mentions death as simply a door in a room that we have not yet noticed and we won't until our eyes adjust to the dark. Children have a complete command of metaphor and, and somehow along the line we lose it. <laughs> I then worked with um, mothers whose children had died in a project called Rest. This mother had made a very beautiful mandala out of the wishbones of all the chicken soups that she'd made since her daughter's death, remembering too the sadness of making chicken soup for her daughter when she was in her final months and days. For me, this work is about finding a way through grief and loss, finding a way to remember and retain a sense of the person who's no longer with us, by weaving a strong and vibrant connection between those who remain and those who are gone. 
The challenges of this work with the dying and the deaths of others in my own life drew me to the work of Dr. Hermione Elliott, who's the founder of an organization called Living Well, Dying Well Training, with which I am now a trainer and we train doulas. And Hermione recognized that as a society, we've become alienated from death and dying. We're neither inwardly prepared and we're often outwardly unskilled at dealing with it. The so doulas are ordinary citizens members of our communities, members of compassionate communities, and we're very much behind the Compassionate Cities, Compassionate Communities movement and often working within that framework. We support families and carers to have the confidence to be involved with those who are dying. We prepare people for what happens to the physical body as it untethers from life. And we help people to plan, to think in advance what they may want at this point in their life. So you might think, what has this to do with our agenda today? Creativity at the end of life. Well, it's interesting that on every single course that I teach, there are artists, and I'm pretty sure there's one here today. They're drawn to working at this most important uh, point in people's lives. And there's a role here for reminiscence work, for metaphoric language, for acknowledging loss and grief through means other than talking. To finish, the process of dying takes only minutes. The rest is living. And becoming with more, coming more comfortable with talking about death and dying feels to me like an essential for all of us in life. We need the creativity to find a language to talk about it, to ignite the spark of meaning and relationship at this most important point in life. I see this as a gift from one human being to another. And I'm gonna close with the wise words of Atul Gawande, a doctor, author and I say I would say storyteller who makes the point we all want to be authors of our own stories and in stories endings matter thank you well thank you Anna for a really beautiful and moving contribution and opening up that discussion of the other space for expression especially in light of the voice of the child, which is of my interest as a pediatrician, but thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to now call on Justine Robinson, who um, is a therapies and wellbeing manager uh, at Pilgrim's Hospices. And as an occupational therapist, Justine delivers creative group activities in hospice settings. Justine, over to you. Thank you. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Yes. So I've been in OT for 24 years. And I've worked in hospice care for the last 11. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we engage with creativity at Pilgrims and why I think it's so important for patients with life limiting illness and those that help take care of them. Um, I will be talking mostly from an OT point of view because I'm terribly biased and it's after 24 years, it's still where my, my passion is. Um, so a little bit of background for those of you who aren't, who aren't familiar with Pilgrims Hospices. We are one of the largest groups of hospices within the UK. We have three sites uh, with a total of 30 inpatient beds. Um, each site has its own um, therapy centre and community teams. So the, the larger part of what we do is always supporting people to remain at home and live within their community. Um, and we serve the whole of uh, the population of East Kent. We're very much, one of the things as any hospice will tell you, we're very much trying to promote the idea that hospice care is not about those last moments. It's about how we help people to live their very best life up until that last moment. Um, so um, my current role is I manage occupational therapists, physiotherapists and wellbeing services across all of those sites and the communities. I, I feel that it's been a really positive step to, to have this role. I've been in this role for about the last 18 months it's mean we've been able to break down professional boundaries and start crossing over into each other's areas a little bit more. Um, for example, there's always been a craft group that's run within the therapy centres that our day services, but having the OTs kind of helping step into that and support the wellbeing practitioners with that group has meant they've brought their own professional language with it. So a group that maybe suffered a little bit from some clinical services, thinking of it as a bit of a sticking and gluing type group, um, we now have, you know, it wasn't quite the real work of medicine. Um, I think now we have that occupational therapy a language around it so we can talk about meaningful occupation, the therapeutic benefits of arts and crafts, 
So um, I, I feel that's been a real help in promoting the services and what we do. Um, so what do we do on a practical level? I've already mentioned we run a, a, an arts-based group, arts group once a week on each site. This is called Time to Create. This is led by our wellbeing practitioners, but with all of us stepping in. It's open to patients and carers. Um, Pre-COVID, it was only open to patients. And I think opening it up so that inviting carers along um, has been a really positive step. It means we get more people attending because carers can come along and bring their person with them. And also, I think we need to acknowledge in hospices that actually people don't want to be separated. This last bit part of time is really precious to them. And being able to come in and create new positive memories um, is a really important step. When you know many people, the only time they leave the house is maybe for a doctor's appointment. This is really a joyful reason to, to leave the house and, and do something together. Um, the group will often have a theme and suggested activities, but people are welcome to bring their own ideas um, and their own projects that they might want to work on. And just recently, we've had carers and patients come along and say, actually, I'd quite like to, to lead a session, which has been wonderful. So we can all sit back and they bring their own creativity. Um, some of the attendees um, at our Margate Time to Create have been kind enough to agree to talk about why they attend. Um, this is a little film I did on my, on my phone, so it's a bit gonzo. Um, and forgive the background noise. I mean, it will give you an idea of just how vibrant and um, joyful this group is. So if we could share the film, Hannah. Um, I've come into the creative classes for about 10 weeks. Um, I've come with my partner who's got a terminal illness. Um, it's something that gets us out of the house, otherwise we tend not to go out very much because it's so difficult to get Jeff out. But it's very therapeutic to come and do something creative. Every week we do something different and um, Jeff enjoys it, something that he never would have done if we didn't come here, although I do craft things at home, it's not Jeff wouldn't participate in it, so it gets him out to do something like this. So, hi, I'm Frank, so I've been coming to this group for hmm, since, uh, since about October last year. Um, it's a really thing for me, um, having been diagnosed with a... Uh, uh, experience of the interiors on that and, and not being able to uh, engage with well, work, it gets me out of the news, gives me something to focus on. And while I'm here, uh, I'm doing something creative, um, it's almost a mindful activity, you can just focus on what you're doing. Um, and uh, all of the other things that you know, sit and look at the back of your mind, you can. Put aside a couple of hours. I should be a really quiet, pleasant lovely evening. I really enjoy it. My name is Eva. Um, I've been coming here for a few months now. Um, I've really enjoyed the content. Um, it's a whole thing to do. Uh, it's really nice to know that there's help at hand in the building. If, if I've got any problems, I need to discuss with anybody. There's always well, I'm Henry Martell, and I think what I like about this place more than anything is the friendship that I feel among fellow people, and I like to think that we're all in it together. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 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 I think <laughs> Uh, 
Thanks, Hannah. Um, we may be find a way to share the link because I'm aware the sound quality is actually better on the, the film. I think it was perhaps the sharing wasn't great. So maybe we can find a way to share the link with you guys later. Um, so some other examples of um, creative, creative activities within groups have been um, recently um, one of my occupational therapists who has an interest in therapeutic horticulture um, run a session making bird feed feeders, talking about getting involved with the Great British Bird Watch and then using the theme of birds as prompts for uh, creative writing. Um, at a carers walking group recently, two of our carers bonded over their love of photography. So um, we encourage them to bring their cameras onto the walk and they are now using that as um, a mindful um, photography session. And then when the weather's too wet to walk, they're coming in and are able to print their photographs and, and use them creatively. Um, as well as for patients, the other thing that um, we do is run staff wellbeing sessions. Um, so the occupational therapists have run a session uh, creating something called Kokodama. I'm probably not pronouncing that right. They're Japanese moss balls. And it's a style of potting up plants um, in balls of moss that you can either then hang or put in a dish. Um, I think this has been great on, for two reasons. Looking after our colleagues, helping prevent burnout, helping retain you know, very valuable staff. But also I think it gives perhaps people who wouldn't necessarily engage in a creative activity a chance to understand all those feelings of well-being that come from that so they can hopefully then um, sell our services and describe what we're doing in the therapy centres to patients and carers with a bit more confidence. Uh, the, other, the other thing I think that we embed within uh, Pilgrims is, is our legacy work. Um, for me, legacy work isn't just about that finished product and what we leave behind. It's giving people that chance to reflect and find meaning, to look for narrative in their life and consider what their legacy might be. Um, I think creativity can help people engage with, you know, quite, what can be quite frightening themes in a safe way. I think, as Anna said, you know, that idea of looking at something through the lens of metaphor can sometimes help take some of the fear out of the subject. Um, so some examples of how we use creativity at Pilgrims to help people with legacy work include creative writing, making memory boxes, um, scrapbooking. Um, a, a big project that the occupational therapists lead on is our voice recording project, which is called the Blackbird Project. Um, there's one of our USB sticks that the voices get recorded on, hence Blackbird. Um, and I think, again, yes, the legacy is that the, the person leaves a recording of their voice behind, which is helpful for the, you know, the people be, bereaved people being left. But actually, there is something around that creative therapeutic per, um, process of considering what your life has meant, looking at the narrative, um, being able to say, I was here and this is who I am. Um, is so important um, and we, we encourage people to um, engage as creatively as they want to within that process so people might want to leave stories or um, share poems or recipes or read a book. Um, I've heard of someone recently who was interviewed by their granddaughter which I think is a beautiful you know, way to share information. Um, so we leave that as, as much as possible up to the individual to engage with the, the process. Um, we also do one-to-one -one work uh, with people who perhaps for whatever reason don't want to engage in the group or need something um, more unique to them. So for instance, I'm currently working with uh, a young lady who has two very young children. So they're going to come into the therapy centre uh, in a couple of weeks time and we are going to have a creative session. It means the patient gets to be mum again and engage in messy play, creative art and crafts with her children. It means we're creating memories. We're taking the fear out of the hospice setting, which is, I think is a really important part of what we can do. We need to acknowledge how brave it is for any of our patients to walk through those doors for the first time. And if we can help do that through the therapy centres and through creativity, 
I think we're we're helping people prepare prepare for a a better death. Um, so creativity is 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 a profoundly important part of what it is to be human. For many of the people we see at pilgrims, their sense of self has been stripped away by illness. They often come to us feeling like they are a diagnosis, a set of symptoms that they're defined by their treatment or lack of it. Um, often they're unable to fully engage in activities that previously had given their life meaning and helped form their self-image. So I believe that engaging in creativity can give them back a sense of themselves as a whole human being, that sense of agency and hopefully a little bit of, of joy. Um, and just to finish, I wanted to share this cartoon by um, Art of Transitions, who is um, an artist called Ellie Douglas. She's a hospice chaplain in America who uses her own creativity to engage with the uncertainty of death and dying. And I think it um, beautiful, beautifully sums up what it is we're doing. And now I need to share the screen. Sorry, this is... <laughs> I said I was going to share this and now I'm not being as clever as I thought I'd be. And apologies. Let me see if I can. Is that sharing? No, but Justine, maybe in the interest of time, we could share that with people. Sure, at the I'll end. pop it in the yeah. I'll pop it in the um, chat. Sorry, I know I know how frustrating. No, no that's is. fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go, there you go. I think you're sharing it now. Oh. <laughs> anyway thank you so much Justine and thank you for bringing up there what I thought was really interesting points about staff well-being as well and so this in, and the interprofessional conversation that happens between different groups um, I'm going to move us swiftly on now to Philippa Anders who um, has a lived experience perspective to share with us. And Philippa will be discussing her personal experience of bereavement and the opportunities and challenges of accessing creativity during this time. Philippa, are you there? I am, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Goody. And thank you to all the other speakers so far. There's been some really big bells going off in my head that really ring true with, with so many things that I've experienced. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm not coming from a position of telling you about some great practice, I'm afraid. Um, I'm coming from the perspective of being a widow, which is a, a horrible word in itself. I think it's, a, it's not a good word. So my story, very briefly, um, I lost my husband on the 22nd of December 2020, 10 days after he'd received a brain tumour diagnosis. Rob died on the day that he was due to have emergency surgery and he was 49, so very, very young. My background has always been in the arts. I decided to leave my job four months after Rob had died so that I could support my two children. I was music director at Snape Maltings in Suffolk where I was developing a national creative health programme. I was also involved in the advisory group for, for this, this group a few years ago but now I spend my time volunteering with the Brain Tumor Charity um, and also a number of arts charities, including Streetwise Opera and Sound Voice. So with all of that, you'd think I'd be the perfect candidate for accessing arts as part of end of life or in bereavement. But sadly, that didn't happen. And that hasn't happened for two reasons. Firstly, there was just no time for us in terms of arts in end of life. Rob died too quickly. We experienced a very traumatic death, which gave us no time to be in an organized space where we could access support of any kind. And actually, sadly, the reality was that we were offered no support at all in terms of healthcare, social care, or anything else. I think it just came down to the speed of which things happened. Secondly, now we're in the, in the next stage in terms of grief and bereavement, the kind of thing that we're looking for just doesn't seem to be out there. And it's really rung true in Lucy's presentation about the difference between individual and community. When you're in this space, it's hard enough to know which way up you are, let alone what might be beneficial is some kind of activity. How do you muster the energy and focus to be able to find something appropriate 
get dressed, get out of the house, eat breakfast, turn up when you're dealing with the horrific, all-consuming admin emotions and trauma in a whirlwind of what feels like chaos. In the 10 days from diagnosis to Rob dying, I didn't have the headspace for anything other than trying to navigate the healthcare system alongside a devastating diagnosis. And this comes from someone who is a huge advocate and knows the true value of the arts. As the months have marched on, I would absolutely be interested in something that could support me and my children through our grief. I'm now in a place where I can start to investigate this, but so far I can't find anything that's appropriate or relevant that we can access. That might be where we are geographically in the east of England. It might be that what I'm looking for doesn't exist. I have, I have no idea. Other than my own stuff, listening to a huge amount of music, walking, gardening, and a new thing for me, writing, I've not accessed or come across anything. I talked to my son last night before I was writing up some notes ready for today, and he described something that really hit me with his feelings around um, bereavement. So if I can just tell you what he said, when death is so sudden, you don't get the chance to prepare for your loved one to die. There is no apparent end of life care to be accessed. You don't get support because you don't know the trauma is coming. As a result, the death seems unreal and the subsequent process of trying to understand what has happened unbearably hard. When death is so sudden, it's not preparing for your person to die that is hard, it's coming to terms with the fact that they've gone. That made me cry when he told me that last night over our shepherd's pie. For me, what's important is some kind of community-based activity. Again, this goes back to something Lucy mentioned earlier. Somewhere where you can meet people in the same boat, people going through the same feelings and emotions, where you can be totally honest, where you're not only doing something that's good for you, whether that's singing, gardening, whatever, but you're also with people that know what you're going through. I turn to social media to find support groups, which have been amazing, but they offer something very different. Emotional support, yes. Meetups, yes. But this doesn't compare to the breadth and depth of experience that you get from something the creative health sphere can offer. I'd like to finish by offering two things for you to consider. Remember, but there isn't always time for end of life planning. Not everyone makes it to treatment or to the wonderful creative safe spaces of a hospice or even to a place as was our experience of being able to say goodbye. Creative health can play a really significant and important role in bereavement. And secondly, remember also that bereavement isn't something that lasts for six months. Something that I'm often reminded about People tell me it's been six months and I should be through it by now. This is something you live with for the rest of your life. You need like-minded people around you where it's okay to laugh, it's okay to cry, shout, scream, where you can ask awkward questions, where you can rant, and not just for six months, but for life. The arts can and must fill this space. Thank you very much. Well, Philippa, I'm finding it hard to um, respond to that because that was just so utterly moving. Thank you for sharing your story. And can I just apologize on behalf of the health and social system for failing you when you needed it um, the most? Um, I will say that you have reminded us that we fail when it comes to language around death and also that we're failing around access um, at people's most critical moment of need. And so. Thank you for just underlining how desperate this need really is still. Um, I'm now going to ask Lucy Turner, who is producer and civic engagement and of the education team at the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester to speak um, with Laura Gallagher, who's a participant of The Still Parents, a program using art to support patients who have experienced the loss of a baby in pregnancy or just after birth. Lucy and Laura will talk about this award-winning program now. So I'm going to hand over to you both. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for inviting us to, to speak today. We're really, really honoured. Um, so it all starts with, with Jennifer Rose. Um, Jennifer Rose is a tiny girl 
who inspired all the work that I'm about to talk about. Um, Jennifer is my daughter, who was still born in 2016. And she inspired the, the project um, Still Parents, which, um, like you say, is a, 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 a series of ongoing workshops that use art and creativity um, to work through experiences of baby loss. Um, so bereaved parents that have lost babies at any stage in pregnancy or just after birth. So the workshops use, like I say, art and creativity um, at the centre. So it's really very much about art and art making. And I think what's unique about this project is that it's coming from an art gallery. It's art, an art gallery that are, are, are tackling and, and sort of helping to alleviate some of the pressures on, on the support, the sort of bereavement support services. So what's important to mention is that the Whitworth Art Gallery, that I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a minute, um, has partnered up with Manchester Sands. So Sands is one of the largest um, bereavement support charities in the UK and we work alongside the Manchester based um, hub. There's hubs all over the country but obviously because the Whitworth is, is based in Manchester we have, have partnered up with, with the Manchester branch of Sands. So the Whitworth Art Gallery is in Manchester, it's part of the University of Manchester and um, is what we call a constituent museum. So is working towards um, using art as a way to kind of um, open up conversations, generate empathy and, and sort of actively address issues that are going on in the here and now. Um, and, and to try to sort of start to make social change. It's also really, interestingly placed um, in that it's opposite um, Manchester Royal Infirmary. So it's opposite one of the largest maternity centres in Manchester and also across the road from Tommy's um, Stillbirth Research Centre, which is one of the largest research centres in the country. So as an art gallery, um, it's almost part of the hospital grounds in that it, in, in, in where it's placed. So this work fits really well um, within this this institution. So just very quickly that um, according to Tommy's the baby charity, um, one in four women experience um, baby loss. And so it's hugely prevalent, yet nobody's talking about this stuff. It, you know, it's, it's almost like it's a, a sort of dirty little secret that people have to keep. And actually that brings a lot of shame and, and a lot of isolation to those that are experiencing baby loss. So in our workshops, they're, they're, they're different. It, it's like Philippa would have wanted. It's, it's a, a workshop that came from um, me feeling exactly as Philippa felt in that there wasn't any, I didn't feel like there was any support out there that was for me. There were SANS support groups which were very talk based. It was sitting in a circle and it was telling people about your experiences. It was reliving the raw detail of your of that particular experience and revisiting and revisiting every time you visited the, the, those sessions, which I didn't feel was, was a productive way of, of, of dealing with what was happening to me. And working in an art gallery just felt like there was a, a, a huge opportunity to be able to kind of use art as a way to kind of productively work through experiences and, and make sense of, of kind of um, these kinds of experiences. So in our workshops, they're not talk based at all. It's about art and it's about art making. And so it's a group of people that have come that come together with shared experiences of baby loss that understand the pain. And those conversations come as a result of the art and the art making, rather than it being the focus. So we do all sorts of things. I should say as well that these sessions are led by professional artists. And so the, the quality of the art that's being produced by the group is, is incredibly high. So we've done photography workshops, we've done printmaking workshops, ceramics, 
embroidery, we've done sculpture, we've done all sorts of different things. So in every, um, in every workshop, we, we try something different. And so it's a way for participants to be able to just um, explore different mediums, to, to learn different skills, and then in the hope that they might find something that really works for them, that they might want to do kind of outside of the sessions. And that's particularly happened with the embroidery. So lots of people sort of wanting to continue embroidery as a kind of mindful and, and creative outlet. So just a quick bit of feedback from participants. So the sessions are so valuable to me, just knowing I can spend time with people that have experienced baby loss without the expectation to have to speak is so comforting. I find being creative and honoring Jonah in that is just so special. It's dedicated time to spend um, thinking about him, which is so precious to me. So the, the sessions also do um, allow just a couple of hours a month for people to carve out um, time to think about their babies, make things for them, and kind of productively work through the experiences that they've had related to them. Because a lot of um, these couples are, you know, of, of childbearing age, they've got children previous to their losses, or they've had children since their losses, so they've got busy lives. And it's amazing to just have an opportunity to sort of carve out time to be able to think about those babies that they lost. So um, two years after the first workshop started, um, we were given the opportunity to have an exhibition at the gallery. So this was an exhibition called Still Parents, Life After Baby Loss. And it ran from September 2021 to um, December 2022. So it's only just come down. So it's on for 15 months and was a real opportunity for us to be able to show and demonstrate um, what life is like after baby loss. So it was, it kind of had two aims. One was to create a safe space for bereaved parents to be able to come and honor their babies and, and feel heard and, and hear stories that they could relate to. And then it was also to try and break the silence around baby loss, to try and change the narrative around baby loss, to get people talking about it, to open up conversations and to just try to sort of, um, yeah, to just get people to, to understand a little bit more about what it's like. So this is what it looked like. It was two huge galleries with work that was created by bereaved parents in the workshops alongside art from the Whitworth collection that they'd looked at, researched and, and chosen that resonated with their stories in some way. And you can just see along the back wall there, there's a, a sort of long vitrine where um, participants loaned special objects relating to their babies. So it really sort of set the context of the exhibition. Alongside um, a, a, a wrapping around the whole of the um, gallery walls, we wanted to create a memory wall. So something that's really important to bereaved parents is to see their baby's name written down because they often don't get to, to see it written down. And so we had a, a memory wall that wrapped right around the exhibition and we had 330 baby names added to that as, as the exhibition went on. You can just see that kind of running underneath all of the artworks there. And that was to kind of personalise the statistics around baby loss. You know, there are hundreds and hundreds of babies being lost every day. And these are, these are those babies' names. These are people's babies. So we, uh, we did lots of evaluation around the exhibition. Um, and um, nine out of 10 visitors to still parents felt that the experience expanded their understanding of baby loss. And two thirds of visitors told us they felt more confident to talk about baby loss after visiting still parents. So the impact that the exhibition had on kind of sharing the subject was really powerful. We had volunteers with lived experience in the space so that anybody visiting could have somebody to talk to or have some um, to be able to sort of signpost them to support if they needed it. We had a place to share, so um, comments cards that you could leave your story um, or any responses to the exhibition. And we were overwhelmed by the amount of, of responses that we received in the time it was on. 
over 300 of these cards with people's personal experiences, just needing somewhere to share and wanting to, to sort of share their story in a, in a society that, that won't listen. Um, as a result, we've um, we trained up 200 student midwives. So we had two study days, one with the University of Manchester, one with the University of Salford, where they came to the gallery and spoke to um, participants and had and sort of gained sort of real personal life stories um, of of baby loss from those that experienced it firsthand, which was really valuable for the, for the, for the midwives to really hear what it's like from, from their perspective. And this is something that we're gonna continue even when the exhibition's gone. This has now become part of the bereavement module in those two universities. And also a really lovely outcome um, is the bereavement counsellor in residence opportunity that we had and so while the exhibition was on um, we worked very closely with the bereavement midwives and the bereavement counsellors across the road they were telling us that um, often when they were visiting um, when um, they had their clients coming after a, a loss they were having to go back onto the maternity unit for their counselling sessions which to us felt cruel um, obviously there's no other option, it was where the rooms were situated, but I think to go back to where you had your loss and where you can see other women having babies just seemed, yeah, criminal. And so we at the gallery have lots of meeting room spaces that, uh, that can be used. And so the bereavement counsellors now use the spaces at the Whitworth Art Gallery um, instead of in their medicalised setting of the hospital, which has had a huge impact on the clients and the, and the counsellors of having just a really non-medicalised, beautiful space that, that they can use for their counselling sessions. Then I'm just going to finish, um, I know I've probably overrun, um, we've just, it's just hot off the press, we've got a book which is a, a, a kind of summing up of, of the, the programme and the exhibition um, that's called Still Parents Life After Baby Loss, which is now available in, on, the, on the Whitworth shop website um, that you can buy. So I'm gonna pass over to Laura, who is a, 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 a brilliantly, inspiringly long-standing member of the Still Parents group, um, and has been to pretty much every session since we started in 2019, um, and has just, got a lot out of the project. So Laura's gonna just share a little bit of more of a sort of personal um, account of how art and creativity can have an impact on bereaved parents. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so I'm gonna try not to talk for too long um, because I have a tendency to do that. Um, I joined, like Lucy said, I joined the project in 2019 um, and it was after, unfortunately, we experienced three pregnancy losses that year. Um, I resonate so much with what Philippa was saying. Um, obviously, after our losses, the obvious happened. I went to the GP. Um, I was given some sessions with a counsellor. But obviously those are, are sort of numbered. You only get a certain amount. That wasn't really enough for me. I didn't really um, want to keep talking about sort of the ins and outs of what, what I'd been through. But I had such a such a big feeling of being alone. You know, I, you know, I've got a very supportive partner and family, but if when you haven't personally been there, when I went to speak to friends and it was just such a difficult sort of, conversations have with them and I almost felt guilty because they just couldn't understand through no fault of their own but if they hadn't been there they just didn't quite get it so I actually found out about still parents by searching online <laughs> um, because I've always been interested in art anyway um, and it sounds like a big statement but it saved me in a lot of ways um, and mostly because I had distanced myself from the life that I had before. I used to work with special needs children and unfortunately my losses, cha it changes who you are, it changes how you see the world and how you perceive situations. And I almost had to go back, back to the drawing board in a way and, and figure myself out again. And without still parents, I'm not sure that I would have got there. Mostly because obviously there is the, the 
companionship you get from the other participants, the fact that you don't have to talk about it. Philippa mentioned something before about being, being able to just laugh about the worst parts of what you've been through because what else is there to do? You know, there comes a point when you've talked about it so much that you need something else. So having that physical thing to be able to hold on to, to make something, you know, once a month, it made a difference to my life so much. Um, then, of course, it's having the control because a lot of, personally with baby loss, you lose control of a lot of things. You know, your body doesn't feel your own. Um, medically, you don't have a say. Things have to be done to make sure that you're safe. So then art became a way for me to control the situation. Um, and it sounds so small, but when something such, so dramatic happens in your life and you have to sort of reevaluate everything, um, you are starting again. So just having something to hold on to is so grounding in those first, first few months, especially. Um, my losses were over two years ago now, but one of the, the best things about Still Parents, it doesn't end. There isn't an end point. You know, when I first joined, we spoke about this idea about the exhibition and Lucy and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, the exhibition was never sort of the long game. All that we wanted to do was be together, support each other, create things and support each other in terms of healing without having to say what happened to you, but just knowing that something happened and it's so similar to how I feel was enough. Um, and that human connection is, is just so valuable. And I think we tend to not realize how valuable it is until we lose it. Um, and of course, I wasn't going out, I'd left my job. I had no quality of life at all. And my once a month sessions were what I looked forward to in terms of seeing some new friends that I'd met, but also in terms of my healing and, and being able to get to the place that I am now. Um, and now I'm so comfortable to talk about it I could talk about it all day because I'm so passionate about the creative side of what Still Parents has provided for not just me, but everybody that's come to the group and experienced it. it it's, I was thinking about it last night and trying to frame it. And it took me back to when I worked with children and I was thinking, you know, when children go through difficult situations, one of the things we often do um, as support staff is creative things to help them process how they're feeling and what's to say that adults don't need that same process too um so yeah I'm going to stop talking now <laughs> thank you oh well look thank you both Lucy and Laura for for that because um I can say as someone who's personally experienced baby loss this is really difficult to talk about and that feeling of being alone and isolated I 100% sympathise with. So thank you for all the work that you're doing and for talking about it and normalising it. Um, what I what really struck me over there about was there about how art can be literally life saving to those who need it, but also that art itself can offer this extension of um, a space for health, a non medicalized space for health to to happen in. And I think that those are really interesting and inspiring things to come out of that for me. Now. We are at the end of our first part of this morning's uh, session. We now have five minutes for a break. Well, it is 10 past 11, so I'm going to make a start with calling everyone back and hoping that we can get on with the second part of today's uh, session. What we heard this morning already has been what I feels very much like a very strong case for why we need creativity in end of life care and what we want to do in the second half of this round table is to look in more detail at how we can make creative health available to all who might benefit from it and who might actually who needs it in that context of end of life care and bereavement so what i would like us to do now is to consider how it can be embedded into systems and to start us off we will hear from imogen thomas from hospice uk about the Dying Matters Community Grants Programme, which funds community-led arts and culture projects, which approach the subject of dying with a focus on equality and inclusion. Imogen is joined by Bright Black and Single Homeless Project, who will introduce their work. Imogen, are you with us? Hi, yeah, thank you. 
Um, thanks so much, Goody, for uh, the introduction. Thanks also to all the other speakers. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and to be part of such an important and incredibly moving as well discussion. Um, so yes, I'm Imogen. I am the Senior Campaign and Content Manager at Hospice UK. So just to give a brief background of Hospice UK, we, we are the national charity for hospice and end of life care. So we work with member hospices, partners, key stakeholders and supporters to make sure that everybody who is affected by death or dying or bereavement gets the care and support that they need when they need it. Um, part of my remit is to run the Dying Matters campaign, which you, you may or may not have heard of, but ultimately this campaign was started way back in 2009 and originally conceived in a response to to a recognised need to get death uh, and, and bereavement onto the national agenda. And today we, we've built on this campaign strong foundations and we're working to really break that stigma and challenge preconceptions and, and normalise public openness around dying. Um, what we've seen in the past few decades is that death has become a medicalized process. Um, what, what, I, what I mean by this is that it, it happens behind closed doors. Um, it's something we're reluctant to talk about. And I think uh, Lucy's points really chime, ring true in terms of um, it's, there's a sort of analogy as well with, with um, childbirth and also with baby loss as well happening behind closed doors and not really entering everyday conversation. We know that death and dying is a social event, not a medical event. And in order to encourage people to think and talk about death, it's really helpful for us to approach the topic outside of the doctor's surgery and into increasingly different spaces. What we found is um, that arts, culture and creativity can provide that safe, comfortable and enjoyable alternative approach. Um, but at the same time, we know from our research that people from minority communities are often overlooked um, and that their conversations are not often taken into account. Um, so that's why we at Dying Matters and Hospice UK have sought to partner with artists and community arts groups to help convey our message in relevant and engaging ways. And that is how we reached uh, the Dying Matters Community Grants Fund uh, program. Sorry, so the program is a, it's a fund supported by Dignity Funerals. It provides small pots of funding to community arts groups who um, who have creative ideas to engage minoritized communities. And, and through this program, we aim to find new and creative ways to spark those important conversations. We wanted to find different approaches that were led by where communities actually are and what they needed. So enabling rather than telling. And we know that it's important to support and enable baby steps. So we don't need everyone to be writing wills or making advanced care plans. Um, but just by broaching the subject meaningfully and in a safe space is what is the kind of thing that we, we are looking to encourage. Um, so to give a, a bit of info about the programme, it launched early last year. Um, we received over 130 applications from all over the country and we were awarded, we awarded four successful projects. Um, we're now fortunate to be starting to run the second round of the project, so more, more on that in the coming months. Um, but um, as was mentioned earlier, I'm delighted to be joined today by representatives from two of the successful projects. So Simon and Myra from Bright Black and Meg and Ruth from the single Homeless Project. So without further ado, I will pass over to Simon and Myra to, to kick off to tell you a bit more about their programme. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, it's a, it feels like a beautiful space to do it in as well, so um, really thankful for that. Um, we uh, run a company called Bright Black. Um, we make uh, playable interactive artworks using immersive technologies like vi virtual reality, augmented reality, video games, and we um, made two of the largest shows in the UK using that with live performance. So our work's really center on liveness um, and how we can use technologies to sort of enhance or go beyond the human. Um, and we look at a lot of what these projects have touched on really, which is um, the things that make video games essentially one of the most dominant cultural mediums. So the kind of market for video games is a good reflection of that. If you look at film, 
um, theatre, there are declining numbers. It's quite actually a reducing um, community of people and makers, but games are absolutely massive and they exploded during the pandemic, which was obviously a period of real isolation for um, most people. And this point, there's a few things within that um, that really cross over to the core of creativity, which is in these interactive spaces, you are um, being a creator of stories. So you have agency within those worlds. You are in a flow state, which means that it, the system, talking about system, is designed for you to um, meet challenges, overcome those challenges and constantly be rewarded and incentivized for your creative play. Um, and also they're massively social spaces. So um, under the hood of games design is positive psychology. Um, and that is um, about playing together as well. So they're some of the biggest communities on the planet um, and they're very connected and they allow us, that allow us to be globally socially connected as well. So we sort of take all those ideas to create um, very human experiences. And uh, we created uh, an experience that is one-to-one, -one, so really intimate, called A Thousand Conversations About Death. So a lot of these technologies are inherently participatory as well. So moving from passive linear consumption, which is um, how you experience film and theater and so forth into an interactive space that is very intuitive, but it also allows you to take risk-free risks. So you're in a virtual space that is potentially simulating the real world, but you can go beyond what you would ordinarily do. And it has totally different consequences depending on what you, the world is um, there to do. Um, so we essentially, we partnered with um, a charity called The Spire in East Brighton which serves a very low income community. And it's a beautiful old church. Um, and we filled it with um, candles, fake candles. And as you walk up the aisle of that church, it's very dark and you're just um, sort of um, covered in candlelight really. You walk up to the altar and there's a gaming chair and a massive screen there. And you sit down, put your headphones on and open up this world. And you're sitting by a beautiful um, river. So in the virtual space, the sunlight's dappling off the water and the sun's going down, there's birds swirling around and you can really hear the sounds of nature. And then you hear your name being called by these two virtual characters who are kind of odd sort of pulpy characters that come to you. Um, they call your name and they welcome you into the space and you basically find out that it's one of their last days and they ask you questions about how you consider your mortality and how you connect to the things around you and then you realize that you can start to um, affect the world you can turn it from day to night like that you can make um, swirls of um, creatures appear and um, at the start you we ask you about a piece of music that makes you feel emotional and you can play it on the gramophone next to you and that's the song that plays as you start to float up off your seat and you see the world below you and it kind of, um, a box comes around you, a dark box and the kind of sound vibrates and you feel like you're lifting above the world. There's stars above you and you can see the little character that's dying, that's um, whose last day it is um, get in a boat and leave the space. Um, so it was a really profound kind of experience and we were really surprised by how quickly people adopted the world and the characters and it allowed them because we were kind of talking about it a lot afterwards to go into a space that was beyond the human so away from judgment ordinary social cues and really explore like expansive this expansive um subject um which you know we're sort of vacillating between being in a messy tangled fleshy human body and having these cosmic kind of wranglings with like death and life and what is it and this kind of third space really allowed people to go there very very quickly so it's like a 15 minute 20 minute one-to-one -one experience 
and then we isolated their audio and I'll let Simon talk about the next part about how we kind of want to create a collective experience out of that. So the heritage of our work over the last 20 years a lot of it is conversation based work where we collect conversations with people about important subjects and in this um, as the game the 15 minute experience is going on as Mara said their voice in the kind of technology that's capturing our voices their voice is separated and recorded uh, on its own and we then go through all of those um, we go through all of those uh, conversations and bear in mind that our work tours so we we tour around the world before the pandemic we we're constantly touring around the world we're beginning again to go around the world and around the UK so we're constantly collecting these conversations and what we're doing is editing moments out of those conversations which are particularly poignant and then the next thing that happens is so if you imagine we like in September we're going to Italy we'll do the show in Italy and the show will be there for a week as the video game in a church and people will come in every 15 minutes and have a conversation at the end of the week the most poignant elements of those conversations are strung together into a live electronic music performance which is sort of like an ambient electronic music performance with visuals where i'll be making the music and weaving in some of those elements of the conversations and myra will be generating visuals um, so then we go into more like a traditional collective experience and then once that performance is done then the performance itself becomes a podcast that goes online and joins our podcast collection around um, a thousand called a, a thousand conversations about death so at the moment we are um, getting the show um, wrapped up for touring and we are preparing the first test performances of the live show in front of an audience I think um, it's really important to point to um, <clears throat> one of the really powerful things about video games is that and um, the technologies behind them um, is that you are able to um, basically ask a question and create a world around that question which invites people to answer it and instead of the artist being the one that sort of proposes the answer or um, creates a story that's A to B that starts here and ends here. You're asking people to come up with those answers. And imperative in that is that you have a multiplicity of perspectives so that we can come to answers about big questions like death. Or we can come to sort of catharsis or inspiration around those things or community around those things when we include those voices. So the whole point is that we capture as many perspectives as possible. And then we knit it in, as Simon said, into a really beautiful collective experience where we can all listen to each other. Um, so we are not the, the sort of artists saying this is the way it is. We are in a much more complex system. Um, and obviously when we think about politics and, and the systems that we operate in at the moment, we're talking about a small group of elite people who define a problem over here, um, disseminate it through a hierarchy and propose a solution over there, and it doesn't work. And so these are progressive um, systems that are pointing much more to where we can go in terms of decentralization, democratization, disruption, decolonization, all of those things. Um, and in that way, when we tour, um, hopefully we can go to lots of different countries and learn so much about how a lot of our research we did about a year's research in sort of grief and loss and death coming up to this project um captures a lot of those um views of cultures that are entirely death-based basically you know like the huge like my auntie passed away at the beginning of the pandemic um and it was even sort of difficult trying to translate that and um, my family is from mauritius um as in an auntie to me is uh, like I'm second mum. And so it was even in the process of talking about it, people not quite understanding the closeness of that. Um, and, but we also did, didn't have a funeral obviously because we're in COVID and we couldn't see her on her deathbed. And, but we did have um, a year's worth of calls every day, which is part of the tradition 
um, you would go, you would do a prayer every day for a year. And um, we did it on Zoom instead. And we therefore got, brought our international family from all around the world um, together to do that. And it was really beautiful. So we did a lot of research into other death cultures to kind of bring in some of the big ideas into that virtual space. So it's not a homogenous space. It's not a reflective of like the English countryside or, you know, a church or, you know, whatever where you process death. It's just an otherworldly space that has very recognizable natural elements to it. Thanks so much, Simon and Myra. And um, we'll just uh, pass over to, to Megan Ruth um, to tell us a bit about the Single Homes Project. Cool. Thank you so much, Bright Black. That was amazing. Um, I'd love to experience it myself one day. Um, we've actually got a slideshow, so I'll just share that now. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, um, so just to firstly introduce myself, my name is um, Megan O'Malley, I'm the Creative Arts Manager at Single Homeless Project, and I manage the in-house art programme, Art House. Uh, and I'm Ruth, <clears throat> I'm the Opportunities Programme Manager at Single Homeless Project. Cool, so um, we're here to talk to you guys today about the Ceramic Life Plaques project um, that we've been running over the past six months, um, which is obviously part of the Dye Matters campaign um, funded by Hospice UK. So you might ask yourself, who are Single Homeless Project? So we are a London-wide charity. Um, we make a difference to 10,000 lives every year over 32 boroughs. Um, we help people experiencing homelessness and people at risk of homelessness through providing support and accommodation, creating access to well-being opportunities and being a voice for change. So, as you can see here, part of the way in which we do this is through our in-house opportunities programme, providing a wide range of activities, including gardening, um, sports, music, therapies, health and art. So Art House Project um, delivers an innovative in-house creative arts programme and this is the programme that delivered the Ceramic Life Plaques project that we're here to discuss with you today. Um, art House Programme offers opportunities to engage in practical art courses, explore creative training programmes and work with local art organisations to showcase participants' work. Um, we provide a range of creative courses in different mediums such as screen printing, spray painting, drama, filmmaking, carpentry and many more. Um, we work with partners such as the fantastic The Tate Modern, uh, the British Museum, the Royal Academy of Arts, um, the Old Vic Theatre, the Old Diorama, Deptford X Festival, and many more. So, as you may imagine, um, death and grief is a really important topic for us to explore with service users, given that death is sadly prevalent in our services and in our service users' lives. People who are experiencing homelessness have the highest mortality rates in developed nations, regardless of age or sex. Dying at rates from three to 10 times the general population. So at SHP Art House, we recognize that although many of our service users have experienced multiple losses in their lifetime, that they may not have had the supported environment in which to process this loss. Therefore, we thought it was time to create a course um, as a way to address this issue and support art house participants to start the process, um, to start processing some of these experiences. <clears throat> so the Ceramic Life Plaques project. Over the past six months, over 20 participants in three separate groups 
All Single Homeless Project, service users and staff have worked together with professional ceramic artists and SHP's own in-house psychologists to grapple with one of society's most challenging and rarely spoken about topics. We designed and delivered a course to support participants to create handmade ceramic plaques made to celebrate the lives of their own lives or someone loved or admired or passed away. The project was inspired by the concept of the blue heritage plaques. <clears throat> so the combination of group work, therapeutic creative exercises and the grounding medium of clay provided a unique creative approach to allow participants the space to express grief and bereavement. We have worked with a range of different services, including a mental health service in Westminster, a floating support service in Islington, and a young people service ages 16 to 25 in Lewisham. We will also be hosting a really exciting exhibition of all the work created throughout all the different courses um, in springtime this year at Greenwich University. And this will be able to showcase the work created and allow participants' voices to be heard. So it's been clear that the courses delivered so far have had some really interesting outcomes. So I'm going to talk you through some of the findings we found and that we were surprised by so far. We were really impressed by the willingness of service users to engage creatively in this challenging topic and engage and engagement was in fact a lot higher than our average courses when we had initially predicted some avoidance from it. We have learned that given the opportunity, people were interested in engaging in grief in this way and celebrating those that they had lost. Another point was that someone who has passed away, people usually tend to avoid talking about their loved ones for fear of causing upset. Bringing loved ones metaphorically into the room by creating art in their memory normalizes discussions about that person and gives others permission to enter into conversations about them. We also noticed that natural discussions around experiences of death came up whilst there was a practical creative task going on in the same room and therefore seemed to make this less intimidating. And lastly, rituals. Rituals are usually a ceremony or a creative way of preserving memories using specific symbols and objects to represent ways in which we celebrate and honor life. As part of this course, we explored rituals by different cultures from around the world to commemorate the death of loved ones. We found this has helped to remember why they're not alone in their grief and how grief is universal. So to find out any more about our exhibition coming up, you're more than welcome to take note of these uh, websites as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what a mind blowing array of projects and just, I mean, I'm just completely inspired by all of that. Um, I, I know that we are running a little bit over on time, but I totally wanted to listen to all of that. I didn't want to um, hurry anyone up. So I hope that the people who are watching will indulge everyone and indulge me in that in that request. I'm going to ask our next speaker to now come forward. His name is, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Tim Strawn, who's the Director of Personalised Care at NHS at Home. And Tim will now consider how creativity could be embedded in NHS personalised care and end of life care pathways. Um, Tim, are you with us? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's been an absolute pleasure and privilege to listen to so many inspiring stories and examples of what people are doing. It never ceases to amaze me, the creativity and the passion and the enthusiasm. And it's just, um, yeah, absolutely amazing. 
Um, so yeah, so just to introduce myself, I'm, um, I'm standing in a fairly short notice for a colleague of mine who couldn't make it this morning, um, Sue Bottomley. Um, but yes, I'm a director in, um, in the national team, um, specialising in personalised care and community services, but I have managed part of end-of-life care in a previous uh, previous role, and um, I'm also a trustee of a, a children's charity um, hospice, um, Martin House in Yorkshire, so I, I do see firsthand some of the amazing work and uh, contribution that um, creative um, 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 forms can help people um, um, it, that, that sort of holistic care. Um, when I um, reflect on what I've heard this morning, and I think what the big challenge is, how do, how do we make this happen? How do we make this happen everywhere? And how do we make sure that everybody gets access and the opportunity? Because we see and have seen increasingly over the last um, few years, particularly during the pandemic, the increase in inequalities and the the, 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 the greater divide. And so I, I think there's three big challenges here for us to sort of face creatively around how we to, together, how we how we get this this embedded. So um the first one is is how do we identify people that most need help? Um, and that sounds a bit of a, 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 a funny question, but actually um, you know, one of the big challenges for part of an end of life care is, is, is identifying people and particularly those in greatest need, the ones that we would least um, be, be aware of. So I think there's something around how do we how do we how do we find those people and reach out to those people at the earliest possible opportunity. I think the second um, challenge then is and this is where personalized care really comes in is how do we then personalize our approach, our personalised care and support offer for that individual. Because again, what struck me really, again, this morning is we're all very different. We all have very different needs, wants, aspirations. So, you know, there isn't a one size fits all to any solution or support um, that we can offer each other. So it's how do we how do we personalise that? And that's through, for me, very good quality conversations that really start to tease out around what matters to people and how do we how do we then articulate that? Quite often we talk about the personalised care, personalised care and support plans. So, I mean, that sounds very formal, but how do we start to really start to capture what matters intrinsically to individuals? And it may be a creative solution. It may not. I mean, there's lots of different ways that people will want support and advice, I think. And then for me, the third challenge and the third really important thing which I think goes to the heart of what we've been talking about this morning is then how do we systematically connect people who need and want help to a support infrastructure that's going to make that difference for them that's really going to to, to 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 help them most and that's where I think this sort of signposting and and connectivity to some of the wonderful things that are happening locally in their area and that's where I think we can learn from other pathways around creating um, directories of service and more structured ways of, of capturing what support and help is out there. Um, and, and so I, I think there's masses of opportunity here because there's so many good things happening. But for me, the challenge is how do we how do we identify the people that most need help and, and go to the root of, of, of inequalities? How do we then make sure that what we're doing is truly personalised? And then how do we um, make sure that we connect people to those the wonderful things that you're all doing in the most effective way? Because quite often, I think it feels like people stumble across these things or just find them through their own um, their own um, their own uh, initiatives. But actually, how do we make that much more proactive? So they're just some initial thoughts from me. Thank you. Oh, Tim, thank you for being so concise and clear and offering us actually three interesting questions to take us into what is now a panel discussion and a Q&A with all of our lovely, amazing panelists from this morning. So that's a wonderful segue. It's almost like you planned it. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna invite all of our panelists to be available to respond to some of these questions and thoughts. Um, and I think that is really the question that we wanna ask, which is like, how do we make this um, available to everybody? You know, we've talked about inequalities and yet it feels like nothing much has changed. So what are we gonna do when it comes to this? Um, and I don't know if anyone uh, on, our, on our panel would like to respond to that, um, that kind of that question. Or if anyone has any thoughts in relation to anything that they've heard this morning, actually, because it's been a, a fantastic morning of, of, of speeches.
Philippa has her hand up, Goody. Oh, Philippa, sorry, I didn't see you there. Yes, thanks, Philippa, go for it. Well, I just thought I'd kick off with a a couple of things that that I was thinking about, again, over Cottage Pie last night. Um, And I think for me, it's about making whatever an offer is. And and I agree with everything that's been said. There are so many fantastic things out there, but does everybody know about them in that moment they need to know? Um, And it's about making it really easy. It's making it really easy for that person to find something. So it's making it visible, really well signposted, completely accessible um, and and really importantly, probably connected to the places that we might already be going or um, be part of. And by that, I mean, um, I don't know, in the very early days, one of the first things we all do is go to a, a, a government website called Tell Us Once to put details in once somebody has passed. And what does that then signpost back to us once we've said passport, driving license, etc.? What does that signpost back to us? And all those other places that we're connected to, whether it's Cruz or Widowed and Young or Maggie's or different things, depending on what the experience is that we've had. What do those groups, agencies, charities do in a joined up way to be able to signpost the most easy, most accessible, most wonderful projects in our direction? That's the challenge. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Philippa. Thank you for your thoughts. I can see that Lucy's got her hand up. Yeah, just really quickly, I mean, I agree with what Philippa was saying. I think there is a bit more of an issue as well, though, is in that not everyone feels comfortable putting themselves forward and finding the information. Not not everyone is able to find information. Not everyone has access to the Internet. A lot of younger people we know and people from minoritized ethnic communities or we don't have English as the first language are hugely disadvantaged because they're not even able to access information that's available online. So I actually think we need to do even more. We need to be the ones reaching into and out to people rather than expecting them to come forward because otherwise the inequities are going to continue. Yeah, well said, Lucy. Um, And, you know, I, I often say this to my colleagues in the NHS, that this idea that there are hard to reach populations is something that we should not we should not accept, maybe we should just be easier to reach in the first place. So um, I can see that lovely Anna's got a hand up. Yeah, just, uh, it's been a really moving morning and, and thank you to everybody. I feel there's a kind of fantastic range and wealth of experience here. And I don't have any 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 easy answers, but I think the, the thing about the inclusion, one of the approaches that we always took as artists working in health settings was to go directly into the NH, NHS institutions themselves, which requires the mediation of someone who, in a sense, can learn the vocabulary and language of those NHS institutions, which probably would mostly have been me, because that is where everybody at some point gathers. Uh, and, 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 And the same would apply to the work that I've done in communities like schools. It would be to go straight into the institutions because everybody goes to a state school at some point. So that, that's that, that's what, and I know it's a bit more nuanced than that, but that's one thing. But the other thing which I think is just the really important thing that I'm taking away from this is Before we do anything else, we have to get the conversation about death and dying into society more generally. Everybody's talked about normalising. And there's beautiful projects here which are, in a sense, normalising. But until we, and and in the old days, I think, before we had a national health system, I suspect, there would have been people in each of our communities who would have been supporting those who, who, who were dying. They'd have been like doulas for birth, that have been doulas for death. We've somehow lost that. And with a National Health Service, we're very clever and we can heal most things, but we can't heal death. And I think that's something for me that we have to really, and there's lots of wonderful projects here, you know, that are doing that. But so for me, that's very important. But I just really want to say thank you to everybody. It's been great. Yeah, thank you, Anna. I think one of the problems with at least the biomedical world, and I can speak for doctors, is that we don't like to talk about things we can't fix. And so there is something about just being able to deal with the fact that this is something we can't fix, but that doesn't make it a failure. And actually, how do we bring that kind of language into our daily discourse such that we can 
have a chat about this and it not be the end of the world, you know, and that's, I think that is something that we're lacking for sure in the medical profession. Now there's a whole flurry of hands. Um, so I'm going to start on my screen from left to right. So Meg and Ruth, you've got your hand up. Hi, uh, yeah, it was just to follow on, I think, from, from what Lucy was saying about a really active approach to promoting the creative opportunities that are out there, and um, that often there are amazing creative things going on, and they, they might be free and therefore seemingly accessible, but uh, for, for uh, some communities, there might be more work to do just to make sure that they're supported to, to access those, uh, those offers. Um, our our, our in-house art house uh, project does a lot of in-house work before uh, many of our service users could feel able to uh, to access some of this fantastic work going on in the community with creative work. So it's just to make sure those communities are are not missed out because sometimes those barriers if they if people are experiencing a uh, trauma or they're in shock from their uh, from grief and bereavement or, or any other related trauma uh, there will be those extra challenges to going into different types of buildings meeting different people creative buildings artistic buildings can also be quite intimidating in some in some ways so it's about really making sure that it's reaching absolutely everybody and not and not just people who feel able to put themselves forward for these offers um so yeah just thinking collectively about that really yeah, fantastic, fantastic point. Imogen, then Laura, and then Myra. Thanks so much. And thank you, everyone. Such an interesting discussion. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of bits that have, have come through this discussion, in, um, predominantly in terms of language. So I think um, you spoke about that, Philippa. It's really, really important that there is some, there is language where we can express um, what well, we as society can express our feelings and uh, the sort of the process around around dying, around death, and around bereavement. Um, and yes, that's one sort of extricating it from the clinical, but also sort of having ownership. So whether it's in uh, minoritized communities, whether it's sort of amongst young people, all these kind of different different places, um, if there is a language. Where, but by through which we can express ourselves then we will be starting on that on that sort of small on that journey um and uh goody what you said about hard to hard to reach like we we learn sort of the hard way that you that that's not a thing like you know it's sort of hard to reach communities are not a thing it's it that's that's sort of projecting what you think is hard to reach and ultimately if you're in that community you are not hard to reach because you are there so it's it's like breaking down that barrier and understanding kind of that there are certain groups who are who are missing out on on end of life care and and that's why sort of the equality and inclusion piece is so is so important um especially in these conversations and then just a final final point and i i, I briefly touched upon this but this um with a campaigning head on thinking about um so i mentioned about childbirth and how that's slightly been reclaimed in the last say 20 years you know this this idea that that you go in understanding the process you have choices you and your partner own this and i think there's a long way to go as as we saw um in terms of uh, child loss and that you know that the whole piece around baby loss and child loss um and also um, being unable to have children but um, if you think about how far that's come and also how far mental health has come in the last 20 years, um, like we can do this, you know, they're, they're, the, the conversation can be opened up and and this can translate within society but then also into, into systems as well so healthcare systems and into kind of opening doors um, in, in politically as well um, to make this easier and more palatable for us as a society. Um, yeah. Thanks, Imogen. And I would like to move our conversation into that idea of thinking about systems. But just after we've heard Laura speak, because she's had her hand up for a little while. Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of things sort of in line with that, what a couple of other people were saying. Um, it's something we've spoken about a lot, specifically to baby loss, about concerning baby loss. Um, you don't really get told about the bad things that can happen. You know, none of that is really introduced into the conversation until it happens and I think that would be such a useful thing to, to change the idea of you know obviously if it's going to happen it's going to happen to you you're going to experience a baby loss but if people were more aware that actually that's quite a normal thing to happen as traumatic as it is it is quite normal it might then help people not feel so guilty and all of the negative feelings that come with it um, 
and and one other thing um just we were we were talking about finding these things to help us it's such a difficult concept that to say to somebody who's in the early stages of trauma to to say go and go and get help because there's nothing harder than than starting that conversation especially when you have no idea where to go to get that help you know to jump through that many hoops it's quite it's quite a big a big suggestion to put put on the shoulders of somebody who might just been through something quite traumatic so yeah Laura that's an absolutely fundamental point about where the responsibility for all of this lies and so much of what we do in health puts the responsibility back into the patient's hands as if they have full control of any of whatever's happening to them um Myra I'm sorry your hand went away but it's come back so <laughs> tell us what you want to say um, I was, you know, we were really thinking about how we live in a death denial culture and that it requires practice. So this idea of death practice, as in we hit these grieving flashpoints all the way through our lives. And it isn't just, um, you know, losing someone that is an encounter with death. If you find out you can't have a child, if your family doesn't accept you for some reason, these are grieving for the loss of something. And so we're carrying this idea of death around with us all the time. Um, and yet it always feels so sudden when it happens. So I guess there's a broader question how we bring back the rituals um, of death back into our society. Um, and obviously all these amazing creative ways of doing it. We now have um, a society where that spends a lot of their time online, a lot of their time on virtual spaces um, that are exploring identities, otherness, the boundaries of what is humanly possible through, on, through virtual avatars and in virtual worlds. And so I think there's a huge space to re-ritualize and find um, death practices in the new emergent spaces that we have, which tend to belong to not establishment voices. They're places with massive communities of people of all ages from, like I was saying, global, you know, with global reach. Um, and I think there's something that powerful we can find there. I love the idea of bringing ritual into what we do in health and art and combining those two things together. I think that's really, really interesting. I'm going to ask the organizers, Alexis and Hannah, that we can have a few extra minutes because the conversation is just so rich. And I hope that we don't have to um, curtail the conversation. So I'm just going to proceed until somebody tell me, tells me to shut up. Um, <laughs> but I, I would like to move the conversation onto this idea of systems because that is what this is about. You know, it's it, we, we've all agreed. Good is frozen. That uh, people Ooh. can access. Um, and one of the questions that we've had um, in our Q&A is that it's clear that um, all of this stuff is healing, but is it possible to introduce creative bereavement support effectively into our healthcare system? Or should we be looking to signpost people to outside agencies, which are supported and funded by other services? So there is this question here of where where sh who should be providing this support and help? And I wonder from our panel, actually, if anyone has any thoughts and answers, Tim may well have a, a, a thoughts on this. Um, sh who's, whose responsibility is this? Can I chip in? Yes, go for it, Lisa. Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, I do think, and as, as I alluded to when I presented, I think we, we have a real opportunity now with the rollout of the integrated care systems because they are now uh, mandated to work with people as well as for people. They're mandated to um, collaborate much more closely with community-based organizations and to consider cultural assets and how we can link with and, and benefit from the cultural assets which exist within our communities. Um, and the Arts and Humanities Research Council funding, which we have for the Western Supermare project, kind of comes directly from that, a recognition that actually there's lots of people now within um, health and social care who are thinking, we want to do this, we're aware of what's out there, but how do we do it better? Um, so I think there is a real opportunity to actually start um, evidencing and exploring models of collaborative working. 
Um, because there are barriers there and we can't be naive and say, oh, we just need to collaborate and that's it. And it's all going to be rosy. You know, there's there are a lot of barriers there in terms of how the health system operates um, and how um, voluntary community sector organisations operate and how they're funded. Um, but I think if we can start generating evidence, exploring that and coming up with models of collaborative working, then that is definitely a positive way forward. Brilliant, brilliant answer, Lucy. Does anybody else on the panel have thoughts about this? Yay, Tim, go for it. Yeah, I know it's it's a great question. And, and what, what's really interesting at the moment is we're obviously moving into a new world of these integrated care systems, integrated boards um, who are you know relatively new from last July. Um, but absolutely they're the, the right place to, 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 to organize these things. They've got the vast majority of the funding now. And it's their local plans and priorities that are really going to drive the agenda. Um, but I, I do think there's a role for regions and you know, national organisations to play in this into influencing the agenda. And so, for example, in the part of end of life care um, space, there are very strong strategic clinical networks at, at national level where there are lots of you know, really enthusiastic clinicians and specialists who are having live conversations about these sorts of issues who are very influential locally that I think can start to impact on this. Um, but for me, it's trying to join this up with wider initiatives where I think the money and the priorities are. So inequalities is a massive priority for local systems at the moment. And I, I'm hearing a lot this morning around, you know, how do we make this better for everybody and, and fairer and equal access? So I think there's a there's a big opportunity personally, I think, around um, how do we play this into the inequalities agenda, join it up with the you know, part of end of life. Again, we've heard a lot about maternity as well. Maternity is a massive priority. So how do we join it up with maternity services? So there's something around that connectivity, that integration across health and social care and wider partners in the community. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is that um, the way that the health services configured it's that it's about life and saving life uh, and extending life and all of those things and how do we change the conversation such that the end is also something that we can be seen to be investing in and to be spending money on or just to just to be valuing you know it's not always about money and economics um, and so there is something here about being able to change what it is that we value um, which again, I think it, it's asking us all to kind of think about the conversation that we use and the, the words. Um, Justine, you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, I do think some of it does have to be around funding and what we value coming from a hospice setting. You know, we are, we, we, we talk about this all the time and, and Hospice UK, you know, talk about this all the time. You know, we fund our maternity services, yet our, our end of life services rely on us selling secondhand jumpers in order to provide any kind of level of care. I think hospices are really well, you know, we, we often are, because we are charities, we are often um, looking at end of life care and bereavement and introducing quite innovative projects. Um, so we're quite well placed to be able to work with all of these other providers, um, but we're limited by the fact that we, you know, our funds are limited, unfortunately. Um, so I think there is something about bringing us more into the healthcare fold so we can work more closely with our colleagues. Um, I don't think I have the answer on how that happens, but, but you know, I, I, think, I think we are we are absolutely primed and ready to do a lot of this work and are doing it already. Um, we just need the support. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here, here. Lucy, you put your hand up. Yeah, sorry, I'll be very quick. Um, just on this point about how we start changing um, social attitudes and the kind of culture around um, healthcare, but importantly, what the general public thinks is the remit of, of healthcare um, and the sort of medicalization that's crept into our society, which Imogen alluded to. I think it's really important that we meet people where they're at and we don't come across as saying, you all need to be comfortable with death. What's wrong with everybody? Come on, you know grief's not that bad let's all you know we have to really be aware that it is um a sensitive and and challenging and painful aspect of life for many people and it can be devastating and so I think arts and culture is really important because it allows people to meet it allows us to meet people where they're at and provide entryways for people based on where they're at 
And I think what, you know, the, the work that Myra and Simon were describing is really a great example of that. As Myra said, there are these huge communities now. And if you go on Instagram and you see how the way people are talking about grief and the way they're talking about um, serious illness and death and dying, it's hugely inspiring, inspiring to see the next generation um, coming through. Um, which relates to what Imogen was saying about mental health and how the, the way we talk about mental health has just completely transformed in the last kind of 15 years. Um, so I think there is there is hope and reason to be optimistic, but we also need to make sure we don't, um, yeah, we don't as, as sort of people more comfortable in this area assume um, that and, and think that everyone has to kind of be where we are. Yeah, thank you, Lucy. Um, absolutely. Alex, you've got your hand up. Yes, I'm just going to say, Goody, I think we do have to, <laughs> we have to bring it to an end. You're telling yes, me to shut just, up. <laughs> just because I don't know. Some of the speakers may need to leave. Yeah, no, no, um, absolutely. We haven't, and Alan was going to do some final words. So I totally, think if you're totally. happy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're right. We must respect everyone's time. And as much as I would like to be talking about this all day, we, we don't have time for that. So thank you to all of the panellists. I'm now going to hand over to Lord Alan Howarth of Newport who is the chair of the National Centre of Creative Health and the co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Arts and Health and Wellbeing, who will give us some closing comments. Well, thank you, Goody. Thank you for chairing this really remarkable event. It's been very fascinating, very powerful, very moving. There have been some extraordinarily courageous presentations, people talking in heartfelt ways, born out of their own personal experience. I particularly thank Philippa, Lucy Turner, Laura, and those others who have spoken from their own experience. We've been presented with amazing programs of work, and we've been confronted with some very profound issues, the medicalization of death, the, the inability that appears to have developed in our society over I don't know how many decades, but I think certainly since the 70s, to, uh, to enable each of us to share and give support to our fellows in society, a kind of conspiracy of silence, an inability to articulate what is so profoundly important and so universal, a loss of the capacity for ritual, which we began to talk about um, in the later stages of, of this morning's discussion, and we have to rediscover these abilities. Um, and uh, Lucy, just as you now gave us that encouraging perspective that our society has learned to talk about mental health in a, in, in a much less restricted and embarrassed and inhibited way, so too perhaps we can learn to talk about death. I think the, there are signs that that, that is happening, that uh, discussion of death and the implications of death is no longer going to be banished from our discourse and from our common experience, our shared experience. Um, so we need to rediscover a capacity to support each other. If you, if you think back to 19th century literature, you see a completely different willingness to contemplate death, to address the issues associated with death. Sometimes um, one might feel uh, one, one might feel almost excessively. I mean, Dickens really binges on death in some of his novels and uh, reminds us that in those days, there were people who were professional mourners because the rituals of death were so highly public and 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 so universal. So um, not that we necessarily want to get back to the Dickensian way of death, but certainly an, an ability to share and understand and to enact rituals together must be must be rediscovered. We must overcome our illiteracy about grief um, and and just rediscover the simple power and necessity of supporting each other. Henry, we were told in, in the presentation, valued above all the friendship that he felt in, in that group. We've been trying to deal clumsily with COVID, death on an enormous scale, um, and with no funerals, as somebody reminded us, and therefore no possibilities of ritual. In the news at the moment, 
the, it's the nightmare story of the earthquakes in, in Turkey and Syria. How do we respond across national boundaries? How do we reach out to other communities? Is the emergency aid that we're sending to Turkey and Syria also going to include people who are skilled in supporting those who are dying and those who are bereaved? I think it ought to do so if we, if we have enough of such people, but I greatly doubt whether the resources are there. And I certainly greatly doubt whether they've been uh, marshaled and organized by the, by the official system. Um, it's, it's numbing and inevitably numbing, but it shouldn't be numbing. numbing. And we've, we've seen in so many of the presentations today how the arts and culture and creativity can destigmatize, can release us from, in, from, from this almost choking silence, can humanize, uh, rehumanize the process of death. We tend to think of technology as antithetical to processes of humanizing, but I think all of us were massively interested and very, very impressed by the presentation from Mara and Simon. It made me think, if this doesn't seem to you a little too far-fetched, it made me think of Dante's Divine Comedy, the extraordinary journey that the poet took through the inferno, through purgatory, into heaven. Dante bereaved, Dante mourning the loss of Beatrice, finding Beatrice, but, but considering very profoundly moral truths, psychological truths, what may be redemptive in an idiom that is from the 13th century completely remote from ours, but maybe new technology and new art forms will help us to, to make comparable journeys. At the end, Tim very helpfully posed three really excellent questions. And it's, it was encouraging to hear Tim as the man from the NHS telling us that the NHS is systematically thinking about, about these matters and uh, is embracing personalized care and personalized care is becoming increasingly important in the, in the array of policies. The Health and Care Act passed last year, which establishes the integrated care systems on the new basis, does offer better possibilities. It's very, very early days to see how the partnerships that the integrated care boards are under a statutory duty to enter into and develop will begin to work. There is a duty that was enacted in this legislation only as a result of amendment in the House of Lords, I may say, but it is, it is there on ICBs to ensure the provision of palliative care in the communities. I'm not so sure that the duty is explicit to provide bereavement support, but as Tim was saying, it's up to the members of the ICBs to develop their strategies. We must watch and see what those strategies are because they're due to produce their strategic plans quite shortly. Anyway, everything that's been said this morning will feed into the review that the National Center for Creative Health is holding, the review of uh, the state of creative health, uh, leading to recommendations that the commission will make to policymakers, both ministers and metropolitan mayors across the country, therefore. Your ideas are massively welcome. Thank you for everything that's already in the chat, which is an important resource. Thank you for the questions in the Q&A. Uh, thank you, please, for responding to the call that we're putting out for ideas, uh, for information, for recommendations which uh, Hannah has reminded you of during the course of the morning and which is there on our website. We will take very seriously what we have to say. I hope that those of you who've attended this morning will wish also to attend our future roundtables. And many, many thanks to everybody who's been responsible for organizing this, um, as I say, profound, fascinating, really valuable event.